Good morning. Good morning. We have a good group this morning. And they're wide awake. Can you hear that? They're all chatty, which means they'll sing, right? No. Great. Thanks. You guys want to stand up? We'll uh, get started. Increase it, oh sweet brain, unveil why we're 
Here's my home. 
need to pray. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. We could shorten that up, couldn't we? Every breath, every minute, every second. I need you. I cannot, apart from you, I, I, I fall apart. It's absolutely true. Is there something specifically you need to say to the Lord this morning? I really need this. I don't know how this is going to go, but here's what, by my perception, this is what I need. And, and let the Lord work in whatever that is. Uh, I'd invite you to join us at the altar this morning if you'd like. That's certainly a good place to pray, or you can stay in your seat or whatever. But uh, let's go to the throne of grace that we may find mercy. Father, as we uh, quiet our hearts this morning, we praise you that you are an approachable God, that you never turn us away, you never put us on hold. Not once have we found you in a, in a difficult mood. But thank you that we can come and we can express our needs. And Father, we praise you this morning that you can do something about those needs. We praise you that you hear our cries. You hear our, our, our pleas. We praise you that, that when we bring things to you and we tell you how, how we think it needs to go, your spirit is, is faithful to interpret that prayer into what we need. Oh, Father, we praise you this morning that you are a transforming God. We praise you that uh, at creation, you transformed nothingness into this beautiful world where we live. We praise you that it, in the Exodus that we read about in your word, that you transformed a, a group of slaves into a chosen nation. We praise you that on the cross, you made provision for us to be transformed from sinners to saints. Oh, we give you praise. Father, we confess to you this morning that we need your ongoing transformation. Hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, we need that transformation. We need you to continue to transform us in Christ, into Christ's likeness, that we might be more and more and more like Jesus. Uh, we need you to transform us into a people of mission, a people who are joining with you in what you are accomplishing in this world. Please make us that kind of people. And we need you to transform us into a people of generosity. Oh, Father, make us the kind of people who, who give easily and liberally. Father, we thank you that when we look in the rearview mirror, we can see evidence of your transforming work. We can see it in our own lives. Thank you that we're not the people we used to be. And we can see it in the lives of others. Thank you that they're not the people they used to be. And that gives us hope that others might come and find the transforming grace and power of Jesus. Oh, Father, we, we have needs of transformation today. There are individuals here who have come saying, Lord, I, I need you to change me. Oh, would you do that? And there are others here this morning who are saying, Lord, this person that I love, this person that I care about, they, they need you to transform their hearts. Please, please do. Father, we come to you representing families that need transformation, that need healing. 
thank you that you can do that. We lift those families to you, Lord. Father, we, we represent a, com a community here that needs transformation. It's all around us. That needs the power of, of the gospel to be applied to their lives. And Father, needless to say, we live in a world that needs your transformation. That needs you to come and make it so different. Oh, please do it. Father, thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you care. Thank you that you love us. For we pray it in the powerful, loving name of Jesus. Amen. You may arise and go. Good morning. Well, it depends on how you handle the time change. You either got here early this morning and the parking lot was empty and you went to breakfast somewhere, or you decided you had an extra hour of sleep, so you decided to stay up later last night, so this morning you're very, very tired, and so now's the time to go ahead and take a nap during the announcement so you'll be awake during Pastor um, sermon this morning. So, all right. We have a lot of things going on. If you'll take a look at this uh, list of, of items, there's lots of things happening. So there's a tithing box in the back, or you can give them online, but there's a need for funds to help out with all the different activities we have that we're going to go through this morning. First one this morning, things are going to be a little bit different. We're going to have our Operation Christmas Child Shoebox packing, and so we're going to be staying here um, for lunch today. We're going to have soup and salad. And we're going to pack a whole bunch of boxes today so they'll be ready to be delivered. And so that's going to change our Bible school program a little bit. The only class that will be meeting this morning will be the ambassador class in room 202. All the other classes will uh, not be meeting this morning because of that. We've got a, um, I know we're talking about Christmas already, but Halloween's passed, so we can go ahead. And, well, the story started a long time ago. But we are going to be having our Christmas music um, program that's going to be presented on December 9th. And so there's practice for that today at 4.30, and then also <clears throat> there'll be Wednesday night at uh, 6.30 p.m. for those who are involved in that. Okay, this is really important, so pay attention. <clears throat> there's going to be a missions dessert fundraiser. They're going to be hanging out to, um, I believe, Honduras. And so when uh, they get ready to go on November 19th, this fundraiser is going to be taking place before and after the service. Now, there's something very, very important that happens. Everybody loves Carol's cake. Unfortunately, people do not go and let her know beforehand how many cakes she needs. So we're going to let you guys pre-order cakes from Carol. So you can see Mindy or Carol and pre-order those cakes so you can make sure that you have one because it's going to be special. So Carol, go ahead and get started now cooking because it's going to take a long time. A lot of people are going to do that. All right. We also have a Christmas blessing tree that's out here for the the um, Eastern Elementary and Ruth Ann Monroe Primary. And so please uh, take those different items off the tree and then bring them back by December 10th, uh, wrapped at the latest. We also need uh, reach homeless shelter donations are needed, so that's another reason to uh, tithe and be giving. And so there's a pickup list of the Welcome Center of the shelter's needs. All right, ladies, if um, you will nudge the man next to you, wake him up. Make sure they're paying attention to this. We have two events coming up. First one, December 1st, we're going to be having a simulcast here of Promise Keepers. And so we're expecting, we're going to be inviting people uh, from other congregations, other men, and we hope to fill this place. Um, it's going to be, uh, we're going to be watching it live from New York City, and it's going to be Friday night, December 1st, from 7.30 to 10.30. So men, we're just going to ask you guys to bring snacks to help uh, keep everybody awake during the break. And um, it's going to be a great time of uh, building one another up and growing together. The second thing is, is the Ignite Men's Conference. And that's going to be taking place, I know this is a long way away, it seems, March 8th and 9th. But uh, we're wanting to have as many men as we can go to that. And so we need to have you let me know, and I'll be in the back for both um, sign-ups for the simulcast as well as the conference. 
because we're going to be uh, reserving some rooms and we need to know who needs to have a room on Friday night to stay down there for the conference. So please let us know for that. Ladies, you have on December 2nd um, a Christmas party that's going to be in the fellowship hall at 5 o'clock. So that'll be a time for all the women to gather together and have a great time. And finally, for the young adults, there's going to be a winter retreat on December 29th through the 31st at Roxbury Holiness Camp. And so there's early bird rate, so go ahead and get signed up for that and uh, get started for it. So um, for everything that I said here, if you want, don't remember all of them, it's all here on this, so you can read through it and make sure you keep up with it. And now before I forget, I need to dismiss pre-K through fourth grade. Um, we'll go down to Bible classes this morning, so you guys will be dismissed at this point. And through first grade, I'm sorry, it said fourth grade here. So pre-K through first grade is the ones who will be going down today. And then um, the announcements are over, so if you guys will go and uh, wake up for uh, Pastor Wilson. And if we give, us, give him a hand as he comes up here for coming in and helping us out. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Okay, it's, uh, it's time for a little housekeeping again. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's a good guess. Yeah, Ruth and I will be missing next week. Um, it's really a good story. We're going to help a church celebrate their 30th anniversary. And, uh, but it's a story too long to tell at the moment. But uh, in, in my place here preaching next Sunday will be Pastor Nan Jeffries. Uh, she's the care pastor, the congregational care pastor at Ellicott City Crossroads. Very warm-hearted, caring individual, and you'll appreciate her ministry next Sunday. So that, that's all the housekeeping. We're not going away forever, just, just a little bit. So. Well, being a perfectionistic firstborn, I, I, I'm one of those people who likes to do things just don't lift hands, but can, can anybody identify with that? You know, there are more firstborns in this world than there are anything else. Yeah, you'll get that after a while. Uh, but for me, it's just a part of my nature. Uh, so much so that to some people's dismay, uh, I will even delay doing something until I can do it just right. Unfortunately, sometimes I have confusion over how to do something just right. I mean, I'm unsure of the optimal procedure or practices. For instance, and this is classic, what is the proper, just right way to hang toilet paper? Yeah. Should you hang it so that the paper rolls out over the top and away from the wall? Or should you hang it so that the paper comes out from underneath and right along the wall? Yeah, see what I mean? It's a matter of grave concern. And, and if you've noticed, the, the advice columnists in various publications don't help us a bit at this point. Now, this kind of confusion exists over how to pray the Lord's Prayer just right. I, I heard about this, this small town where the, the Methodist and the Presbyterian congregations worshiped together for the summer months. They would rotate between the two sanctuaries for three months. For the sake of harmony, the worshipers used whatever form of the Lord's Prayer was traditional for the host congregation. You know, whether you're going to say debts or trespasses or sins, you know, whatever was common in that building, they, they would use that on that particular Sunday. So on the final service of the summer, one of the pastors announced, the time has come for the Methodists to return to their trespasses and leave the Presbyterians to their debts. <laughs> there really is confusion at this point, isn't there? Which word is just right? 
You ever listen to people pray the Lord's Prayer together? We do all right until we come to that fifth petition. And then what happens? The volume just drops off like off a precipice. And there's a lot of mumbling. But the confusion goes even deeper than that. It goes even deeper than, than, than a choice of words or a particular version. There is confusion over the meaning of this petition. We're, we're not sure what we're praying here. We're, we're, certainly, we're, we're not certain that we need it or that it's appropriate. And yet, Jesus clearly includes this petition in the Lord's Prayer. We're almost afraid to ask, but what is really going on here? What am I declaring when I pray this part of the Lord's Prayer? Well, may, maybe the place to begin is to simply ask, which word should we use? I mean, is one more correct than the other? What is it exactly that we are asking to have forgiven? Well, a, a, as you may know, there are two biblical versions of the Lord's Prayer. And wouldn't you know it, each uses a different word. Matthew's account uses debts, while Luke's rendering employs sins. Now, they're actually two aspects of the same truth. Debts involves sins of omission. In Jesus' day, it was a legal term for damages awarded in a lawsuit. It's very similar to our idea of liability. A debt is an unfulfilled responsibility. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Consequently, you have an unpaid debt that you owe. Now, spiritually, it refers to our failures to render to God his due. It's a failure in duty. It is what I have neglected or omitted. Sometimes it's translated shortcoming. So when we pray, forgive us our debts, we mean our blindness, our neglect, our omission of what we could and should have done. Sins, on the other hand, involves sins of commission. Now, this is an archer's term for missing the mark. Now, it's not missing the mark by accident or inability it's not because of a lack of coordination. You know, there's more to using a bow and arrow than you think. Some of you guys know that when you're trying to, to, to take down Bambi's father, you know. But it's purposely missing the mark. I choose to miss the mark. Now, spiritually, it describes a person's willful actions that are off target from God's will. You see, God's target for my life is right over here. See it? So I exercise my independence. I shake my puny little fist in the face of God, and I rebelliously shoot over there. So when we pray, forgive us our sins, we are talking about our deliberate transgressions of the known law of God. Now, when we put these two terms, ter te easy enough for you to say, when we put th these two terms together, we quickly realize that we are morally and spiritually bankrupt. There is no way for us to pay our spiritual debts. We cannot tighten our belts or pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps because we have no belt or boots. Jesus is vividly describing our spiritual balance sheet which on our own is always in the red, no matter what we do. We cannot work off our account with God. So, if I have these spiritual debts, which I do, what does it mean to be forgiven of them? Well, on another occasion, Jesus is again discussing this whole issue of forgiveness. And as is often the case, he tells a story. Now, the story 
is about a king who got to examining his books one day, his financial accounts. He was going over the various accounts and reviewing who owed him money, and as he did so, his chief accountant, his CFO, was right there with him, and when it came to the appropriate place, uh, that accountant took it upon himself to uh, call the king's attention to this one particular servant who had accumulated a debt of $20 million. Now, we're not sure how this man managed to go so deeply in debt. Only thing I can figure is that he must have responded to every credit card offer he ever received in the mail and via email. However he did it, though, this servant was now hopelessly in debt. Well, this was the inevitable day that he had so dreaded for such a long, long time. I mean, in the back of his mind, he knew this day was going to come sometime. The king called him in to settle his account. Since he could not pay his huge debts, the king ordered that this servant, his wife, and children be sold into slavery in order to recoup part of the debt although they, they certainly wouldn't sell for $20 million down at the slave auction. Now, that was a common practice in that day, by the way. You wanted to stay current on your debts because if you weren't, you could be sold into slavery. Well, as the king was ordering him sold, however, the servant fell to his knees before the king. Begging for mercy, he pleaded, be patient with me and I will pay you back everything. Well, the king realized that there's just no way this could ever happen. I mean, he wasn't born just yesterday. He may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. But moved with compassion, the king canceled the entire amount and set the servant free. He forgave the entire debt. He totally canceled it. He stamped those loan papers Paid in full. Now, have you identified the characters and symbols in Jesus' story? They're, they're pretty obvious, aren't they? The king, obviously, is none other than God himself. The servant, well, that would be us, humankind. The debt consists of our huge load of sins. Jesus declares, this is what it means to be forgiven. You owed this gigantic debt to God, which you could never pay. But in forgiveness, God cancels every last penny. To be forgiven is to be pardoned. To have our sin and guilt removed and the slate wiped completely clean. You see, our forgiveness is absolutely enormous, almost too big for us to comprehend or grasp. Now, if this is what it means to be forgiven, let me ask another logical question. Who needs it? I mean, I, I don't know whether or not you have met them, but there are some people who sense no need of personal forgiveness. Forgiveness is always for someone else, not them. Mm -mm. Jesus told another story one day about two men who went up to the temple to pray. Now, one of those men was a despised tax collector whom society regarded as the scum of the earth. You couldn't get any lower than being a tax collector. The other man was a Pharisee. He was one of a group whom society regarded as the most holy of all. And, and you know why they regarded the Pharisees as the most holy of all? The Pharisees had told them they're the most holy of all. Well, this tax collector stood over in the shadows and pleaded for God's mercy because of his sins. There was no doubt in his mind that he was a sinner that he, that he had just sinned at every twist and turn, and he needed God's grace. 
The Pharisee, however, proudly recited to God all of his spiritual virtues. He stood out in the open and prayed, I'm not a thief, a crook, or a womanizer. I fast twice each week, and I pay my full tithes. He was one of those people who senses no need of forgiveness. This is not the witness of Scripture, though, is it? I mean, God's word clearly declares that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Even Pharisees, and even you, and me. In another place, the biblical record states that the person who claims to have never, ever sinned, and, and thus be in no need of forgiveness, that that person is called a liar. Who needs to be forgiven? Everyone. Every last one of us. So, so do you see how important forgiveness is? Oh, notice that Jesus links it here with our need in the Lord's Prayer for daily bread. What does he teach us to pray? And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. I mean, it's, it's, it's inextricably bound together. It's as essential to our well-being as food. It's one of our most basic needs. God's forgiveness is the necessary first step of all spiritual and emotional wholeness. Uh, Lloyd Ogilvy, when he was chaplain of the U.S. Senate, told the story of a, of a sick woman who had under, underwent an extensive series of tests. They had given her every test they could think of. She fully expected some wonder drug to be prescribed that would cure her illness. Instead, her doctor's prescription was this. Your future happiness depends on being forgiven. You see, but how? How can I be forgiven by Almighty God for all I have done? Well, it, it's simple. God has declared that if we come to him and confess our sins, meaning we openly acknowledge them, we're not rationalizing, we're not making excuses. If we come to him and openly confess them and ask his forgiveness, he will forgive. Now, the sign of sincere, genuine confession, of course, is that we repent, that we turn around, that we turn away from our sins and no longer live in them. You see, it won't do to confess our sins on Sunday so that we can return to them on Monday and accumulate a whole bunch more for next Sunday. That's not, that's not how that works. You see, but Pastor Dick, what, why must Christians pray this prayer? I mean, after all, Christians have already confessed their sins and asked Jesus to come into their hearts. Hmm. I understand your question thoroughly. You see, I asked myself this very question a lot growing up. I would say to myself, if I'm a Christian, then I don't need to pray this part of the Lord's Prayer anymore. Oh, I'd, re I, I'd surmise we, we must be praying it together for someone here who does need to pray it. I just figured that it was for someone else. But folks, it's rather evident that Jesus is directing his followers, not unconverted, unrepentant sinners, to pray this prayer. So, so what's the deal here? Christians need to pray this phrase regularly. You can't put this petition on the shelf after so long on the journey. You say, but why? Well, first of all, it, it helps us to avoid denial. You see, we are all tempted to be like the Pharisee in Jesus' story, to bask in our own self-righteousness and goodness, to disclaim ever having done anything wrong. But that's not true. And we know it, as well as we know our own names. We all have weaknesses, faults and failures. We all fall short of God's desire for us. As one pastor of our doctrinal persuasion puts it, 
We believe that even the best of Christians constantly need the atoning blood of Christ to cover mistakes, faults, weaknesses, sins of omission, or sins of commission. You say, well, Pastor Dick, well, I, I was with you. Right up until you use that S word. Did, did you really mean to say sins? Yep, that's what I said and what I meant. Folks, let's remind ourselves that we do not declare that the Christian cannot sin. We don't say that at all. We know better. We believe that it's possible for Christians not to sin. That the grace of God is so powerful, we can live a life of victory. The Apostle John makes this very clear in one of his letters to new Christians. He definitively declares that it's God's will that we do not sin. But he goes on to say that if we do sin, we should immediately run to Jesus and confess it, promising that Jesus will serve as our advocate, our defense attorney before God. Let me quote one of my favorite Nazarene spiritual authors who writes this. As disciples of Jesus, we must pray for forgiveness to keep our relationship with God unclouded and our relationships with others unbroken. We are called to be a confessional people. Our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Now, there's, there's one more thing we need to notice about this forgiveness business. Some of you have been hoping I would ignore it or just, just look the other way, but I can't. It's there, and it, it's, it's way too important to ignore. The truth that we dare not neglect is this. Forgiveness is conditional. Forgiveness is conditional. Now hang in there with me. Jesus teaches us to pray what? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Meaning those who have wronged us. You see, forgiving... And being forgiven are inextricably bound together. They cannot be separated. This truth is so critical that Jesus immediately returns to it after completing his prayer blueprint that we call the Lord's Prayer. The next two verses are these. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ooh. That's that's, that's pretty strong stuff. We can't ask God to do for us what we refuse to do for others. It's impossible to expect God to make you a new person in Christ while you keep your heart full of hate. Do you happen to remember the second half of Jesus' story about the king completely, who completely gave his servant $20 million, a $20 million debt? If you remember, that, that servant just didn't get it. Immediately upon leaving the king's court, this guy seeks out a fellow servant and grabs him by the collar and begins choking him, demanding that he pay what he owes. And you say, what did that other servant owe the first servant? 20 bucks. That's it, $20. His fellow servant falls to his knees and begs for mercy. He says to the first servant, be patient with me. And I will pay you back. Doesn't that sound vaguely familiar? So what does this recently forgiven man do? 
Does he forgive as, as he was forgiven? No. He throws his fellow servant in debtor's prison over 20 bucks. So what does the king do when he finds out? And the king always finds out. He boils with anger and calls that unmerciful, unforgiving servant back in. Then the king sentences this man to prison until he can pay back every penny of the $20 million. So what is the truth being communicated here? Forgiveness is conditional. Now, I believe some of our indigestion and apprehension over this forgiveness business is rooted in some misconceptions that somehow we've accumulated along the way. One of those declares this. If I have really forgiven, then I've totally forgotten. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Just not true, folks. We're not created that way. Some of those vivid memories of hurt and wrong will always be on the hard drives of our minds. Well, another states this. If I have really forgiven, I'll expose myself to your abuse again. Uh, this is not it either. Now, I'm not talking about holding a grudge or, or punishing by being distant. But self-protection and limited disclosure to avoid further hurt are God-given instincts to be followed. Another one proclaims this. If I really have forgiven, our relationship will go on as if nothing ever happened. Folks, that's not always possible. I... I I don't remind you of it every day, but sometimes things are changed forever. Over 40 years ago now, I knew a college professor who had an affair with one of his students. In fact, uh, he fathered a child by her. Miraculously, God forgave him and the marriage relationship stayed intact. But folks, that marriage relationship was changed forever. I mean, they, they couldn't pretend it had never happened. Not as he sat there writing out the child support check every month. That wouldn't be forgiveness to pretend it had never happened. That would be denial. Now, let me tell you what true forgiveness is. If I've really forgiven, I've given up my right, put that in quotes, to get even or retaliate. Now, I could, but I won't, ever. If I've really forgiven, I want the very best for you. I don't secretly desire to see you hurt or suffer. Um, instead, my honest dream for you is to, that you would prosper and flourish and be all you were created to be. If I've really forgiven, I do not nurture the memory of your wrong, but instead allow God to heal. I do not review the de details every day to keep them fresh in my mind and my wound wide open. Instead, when those memories return, I once again take them to the foot of the cross and lay them at Jesus' feet. Now, the critical question in, in light of what Jesus is teaching here is this. Who do you need to forgive? I mean, is it, is it someone from your distant past who inflicted incredible pain and suffering on you such that it, it continues to shape you today? Or is it a friend who betrayed your confidence? Or, or is it a coworker who intentionally blocked your path to advancement and promotion? Or is it a spouse? Or your ex-spouse? 
Who is it you need to forgive when we pray this prayer together? You say, but, 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 but Pastor Dick, how? How do I ever do this? Well, start by recognizing your wound and the denial and, and just face it. Quit playing games with yourself and say, yes, it's there. Then accept your own responses. What have you been doing in response? Is it anger or bitterness or avoidance? Admit to yourself what you've been doing and then forgive. Actively, consciously forgive. In your heart and in person, if God leads, say, I give up my right to get even or retaliate. Then release both the offense and the offender to God. In your mind, visually carry that person to Christ. Pray, Lord, this pain and its inflictor, I leave with you. You are the only wise, perfect judge, and I know I can trust you with it. Then begin to consciously design a strategy for dealing with the offense and the offender. Ask, how does God want me to approach this situation in person? Intentionally map out a plan. You may, at this point, want to enlist the, enlist the counsel of a mature Christian. And then finally, forgive yourself and move on. While it will return to your memory at times, it will not help to dwell on. Friend, trust me, you don't want to camp out here for the rest of your life. Now, allow me to point out one more thing that is so obvious uh, that we may miss it. God is the source of all forgiveness. He's the originator of it. None of it begins with you and me. So when we pray, our Father... It's a plea for grace. It's a plea for the grace of forgiveness. We have sinned and cannot do anything to take our own guilt away. But God, in his incredible, incomprehensible love, sent his one and only son, Jesus, to earth. Christ suffered and died on that cross so that you and you and you could be forgiven. As the old hymn writer exclaims, Christ has for sin its home it made. If your sins are ever to be forgiven, you will have to confess them to Christ and ask for his pardon. God is our only source of forgiveness. Thank goodness he loves to forgive. But folks, when we pray our Father, it is also a plea for grace to forgive. Maybe you haven't discovered this yet, but it is absolutely impossible for you to forgive by yourself. Left on your own, you are destined to hold grudges, cultivate bitterness, and plot revenge. Only by the grace of our forgiving Father can you declare you wronged me and meant to hurt and harm me? But I forgive you. Let me be a bit confessional this morning. Some of my greatest struggles in life have come at this very point. Sensing forgiveness and forgiving have been difficult for me. You see, my, my gene pool is full of overly sensitive consciences and grudge holders. There have been two specific occasions when no matter how much I prayed, I could not seem to turn a corner in this forgiving business. Both times, finally, I asked a colleague to anoint me for healing. And both times, God answered my confession of inability 
and my plea for grace by miraculously empowering me to forgive. You see, forgiveness takes divine healing. To be forgiven is to be healed of a spiritual disease called sin. To extend forgiveness takes the healing of our souls. My, my deep suspicion is that some of you are struggling and perhaps even despairing over some forgiveness issue. Per, perhaps there's a besetting sin in your life over which you just cannot seem to gain victory. Or, or maybe there is a person in your life who has wounded you deeply, and no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to forgive. Here's what I'd like for us to do. In a moment, we are going to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. You say, what does that got to do with forgiveness? Uh, that would be like everything. His body broken for us. His blood shed for us. Oh, that takes us right back to the cross. And, and why was Jesus on that cross? Well, he was suffering and dying for each of us so that we could be forgiven and come into right relationship with God. It's got everything to do with forgiveness. But then after we have partaken of the Lord's Supper, I'm going to invite any who wish to come and be anointed for healing over a forgiveness issue. Now, no, no one's going to ask you anything about it. I'm not going to. No one else is going to. I will simply anoint you with oil, which is a symbol of God's grace. You say, well, what will I be saying if I come? You'll be confessing to God, I can't. But you can. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you are a forgiving, grace-filled God. We praise you that you're a God of love who didn't leave us in our mess, but instead sent his one and only son to die in our place. Oh, that should have been us. Thank you that Jesus took our place and that we can be forgiven of our sins because of what he has done for us on the cross. Oh, Lord, help us never to take this for granted. When we come to this part of the Lord's Supper, take us back there. Help us to remember what it is Jesus has done for us. Help us to be forgiven. Help us to be thankful. That night, Jesus took the bread. He broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And shall we do the same? same night, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, gave it to them and said, take, drink, all of you, for this is my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And shall we do the same?
Father, while we linger at the table, thank you that you are a God of healing. We confess to you that this whole issue of forgiveness is difficult for many of us. Some of us can't can't figure out how you could ever forgive us given what we have done. Oh, we need you to heal us at that point, to trust your forgiveness. And Lord, others of us have trouble forgiving others. In fact, some of us have a list of names. Oh, Lord, would you heal that? Would you miraculously bring us to the point where we can in all honesty say, I no longer hold it against you. If for any forgiveness issue you would like to be anointed this morning, I invite you to come. Father, thank you that we can trust you with all those issues. For I pray it in 
Jesus' name that you say. you guys like to stand up? Lord bless you as you go forgiven and forgiving. God bless you.